Iran says it's willing to recommit to the 2015 nuclear deal, but only if it gets $15 billion for oil sales in return. That plan was proposed by France in a bid to salvage the agreement. But that proposal will need the approval of the United States. Well, Doreen, we've heard from the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, who's been speaking at his weekly cabinet meeting. He says that it is unlikely that the Iranians will see a proposal that is agreeable to them in the next 48 hours. That's because they've set another deadline for the European signatories to uphold their end of the deal under the nuclear agreement that will run out by Friday. The president said that Iran will go ahead and take the third step in scaling back its commitment under the nuclear deal and that this third third step that Iran will announce then will be a big advancement towards Iran's nuclear program. The United States is close to a deal with the Taliban to start withdrawing American troops from Afghanistan. America's special envoy, Zalmay Khalilzad, told Afghan leaders about the deal on Monday. It will require the U.S. to pull out 5,400 troops within 135 days of the official signing of the agreement. There are 14,000 troops in Afghanistan at the moment. The agreement cannot be finalized until it receives President Trump's signature. CBS News national security correspondent David Martin is at the Pentagon. David, what more can you tell us about this deal? Well, if the U.S. goes down uh, to 8,600 troops, which is what the deal calls for, going from the current level of 14,000 down to 8,600, uh, that will bring the U.S. back to where it was at the start of the uh, Trump administration. Brand new footage of the Bahamas tonight showing the total devastation Dorian left in her wake. You've seen some of this, but tonight relief officials from the United Nations and the Red Cross are mobilizing to deal with this unfolding humanitarian crisis. Dorian's on record as one of the most powerful Atlantic hurricanes to ever make landfall. Seven deaths have been blamed on the storm, but we do expect that number to grow. The full scope of the disaster is still largely unknown. A sense of hopelessness right now, and you can imagine why you're on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and a lot of that ocean is now right in front of your house or over your house. In many cases, unfortunately, as we flew over uh, the Abacos today, it, you really have to see it to kind of believe what kind of damage and devastation that this storm brought to that island. And you can imagine what's Grand Bahama as well, while we haven't been able to see that, but you think that it's it's easily going to be just like that because as jackie mentioned winds 185 miles an hour sustained gusts well over 200 miles dorian is moving north heading toward the carolinas and residents there are racing to prepare charleston's airport is set to close this afternoon and a mandatory evacuation of all of North Carolina's barrier islands is going into effect. Good morning to you, Robin. Authorities are warning residents here who are staying, and there are many of them, to keep off the roads, really starting this afternoon. Their concern is something that happened last year. They had to rescue 40 people from flooded vehicles, and they're not trying to do that again. But to give you a sense of what Charleston is facing, I want you to take a look exactly where I'm standing right now. And now take a look at these pictures. This was Irma two years ago. It was a tropical storm and the storm surge was pouring over the seawall. Charleston can flood in a regular rain, so they are certainly expecting flooding with a hurricane nearby. In the past four years, many families here have been flooded four times. Funny tonight, there are always the heroes, the volunteers who look out for the dogs, too. Tonight, the brave men and women, the first responders, the volunteers in the Bahamas during Hurricane Dorian. Volunteers rescuing families. This volunteer looking for the owner of a dog rescued in rising waters. And tonight, the story of Chella Phillips. She runs a shelter called the Voiceless Dogs of Nassau, Bahamas. And during the hurricane, she sheltered nearly 100 dogs from the powerful storm in her own home under her bed, in her kitchen, in the living room. She just posted online hours ago that they had lost power and her home had taken on water, but that she and the dogs are all okay. 
She wrote they were scared, that the wind sounded like a train that would not pass. Chella says she played with them, gave them treats. She even sang to them. And tonight, Chella writes, my 97 rescue dogs and me are safe and made it through. Jane, you're in Cape Town, where the World Economic Forum starting in Africa today. There's lots of high-level delegates there, and this racist violence is, is quite embarrassing for South Africa. Totally embarrassing. I mean, international investment is what this country needs at the moment, more than anything, to kickstart a very moribund economy. And the World Economic Forum is taking place in Cape Town, uh, you know, South Africa's most beautiful city, the jewel in the crown. And yet set against uh, this beautiful backdrop is this, these incredible days of lawlessness that everyone is talking about. Uh, the, the violence that we've seen prompted a rebuke, a sharp rebuke from the government of Nigeria, who said enough is enough. Their people in uh, South Africa are, are the targets, uh, the primary targets of this lawlessness. Uh, uh, the authorities in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe and Zambia have also warned their people to be on their guard. And Zambia has even cancelled a friendly soccer match against South Africa on Saturday in protest. the major move now by Walmart. The nation's largest retailer tonight announcing it will no longer sell ammunition for handguns and assault rifles, and it will ask customers now not to openly carry firearms into its stores. All of this comes one month to the day after a gunman killed 22 people at a Walmart in El Paso. Tonight, following a month of mass shootings, the stunning announcement from Walmart CEO to employees to, quote, make the country safer by ending sales of all handgun ammunition and ammunition used in assault-style rifles. The retail Goliath sells one in every five bullets in the U.S. The NRA tonight calling the move shameful, but others applauding it. I think they've been looking at additional solutions, and I think the steps they're taking really show the need for corporate America to step up and make a difference. Walmart, which stopped selling military-style weapons in 2015, saying it will cease all handgun sales in Alaska, the last place in America it sold them. It's what millions of people have been demanding for months, the complete withdrawal of an extradition bill that many in Hong Kong had come to view as a symbol of a much larger problem. The government will formally withdraw the bill in order to fully allay public concerns. The Secretary for Security will move a motion according to the rules of procedure when the Legislative Council resumes. The bill led to months of protests that have at times paralyzed parts of the city, seen hundreds of arrests and regular violence with police. The Honorable Mrs. Carrie Lam Cheng Previous overtures from Chief Executive Carrie Lam to suspend the legislation in June and then announced that it was dead in July failed to end the unrest. There are more large rallies planned in the days ahead, which is when we'll find out if Carrie Lam's decision will have the desired effect or if protesters believe it's come way too late. Both our countries clearly understand that nowadays we need a multipolar world to achieve peace and stability, and our cooperation is very important to achieve this. It's already become somewhat a tradition. Day one here in Vladivostok at the Eastern Economic Forum is usually when Vladimir Putin and his most important guests spend most of their time together getting involved in all kinds of activities and this year the number one guest at the forum is the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So on Wednesday it all began with the leaders met, shook their hands and straight away boarded a motorboat to go to another town where uh, there is a shipyard and that's a very special one uh, because that was the location where a submarine intended for the Indian Navy was once modernized. Speaker, if I decide to wear a turban, or you decide to wear a cross, or he decides to wear a kippah or a skullcap, or she decides to wear a hijab or a burqa, does that mean that it is open season for right honourable members of this House to make derogatory and divisive remarks about our appearance? For those of us who from a young age 
have had to endure and face up to being called names such as Towelhead or Taliban or coming from Bongo Bongo land, we can appreciate full well the hurt and pain felt by already vulnerable Muslim women when they are described as looking like bank robbers and letterboxes. So, so rather than hide behind sham and whitewash investigations, when will the Prime Minister finally apologise for his derogatory and racist remarks which 